All right. Uh, welcome, everyone. It's uh, my great pleasure to uh, have Ola Svensson uh, talking today. Uh, Ola is a faculty at EPFL, and um, he's had just an incredible line of work in approximation algorithms uh, over the years. It's basically, going after one fundamental problem after the other, and knocking it down, you know, matching, TSP, scheduling, on and on and on. So today he's going to tell us about his recent result on uh, finding uh, matchings in quasi NC time. All right, thank you. Yeah, so this joint work with Jacob, who is not here, but no, he's there. <laughs> All right. So so this is about uh, uh, we will see about deterministic algorithms in parallel time. Okay. So how there is a well-known randomized algorithms that works in parallel time. So how can you get deterministic algorithms? So let's start. Maybe many of you know the problem. So I'm given a graph. Can we pair up all the vertices using edges? So anyone see, see is a perfect match in this graph? Or, <laughs> what? You don't see? <laughs> <laughs> so, so it turns out that this graph is pretty tough. So actually, it's a good example. We will see later on an approach for biplet graphs. And this is a good example to explain why that approach fails for general graphs. So we will come back to this, even though you know the green perfect matching is trivial. So, so yeah, so perfect matching is a benchmark problem in computer science. So this is Jacobi, who apparently you can trace back the type matching algorithm. And this is uh, Jack Edmonds, who you know did uh, polytime for general graphs uh, in, I think, in 65. So where he gave the polynomial time is equal to efficient. OK, so then, since then, we uh, like this problem. We have studied it in basically all the pro uh, models. And uh, we will study it in parallel. This is the same parallel as uh, VJ talked about two weeks ago. So what is this parallel? So, you know, it's a... Uh, here we will be interested in something called Nick's class, or NC. So let's, you should think of problems that uh, paralyze completely. Okay, so this means that I allow you so, to use too many processors, you could imagine, like polynomially many processors, but allowing you to use that many processors, you should be really fast. You should run in polylogarithmic time. It's also it's equivalent to PRAM, where you have polynomially many processors, shared RAM. Also, in more uh, modern terms, these algorithms is known <laughs> to imply like MapReduce algorithms with a logarithmic uh, number of rounds. All right, so that's the model. Uh, now, one of the main questions here is whether we can solve the matching problem in parallel time. So if I give you polynomially many processors, can you solve the matching problem in polylogarithmic poly time? So the reason we like this question is that we have like known for four decades that if we allow the processors to flip coins, we can do it. And this was proved first in like the 79 by Lovas for the decision version. Can you decide whether a graph has a perfect matching or not? Okay. And it turns out that in this model, normally, right, if you're interested in poly time computation, decision is the same as search. If you can decide whether a graph has a perfect matching, you can take an edge, remove it, does the graph still have a perfect matching or not? So you can just, you know, query. But in random, you know, in parallel, you cannot do that. You have to be quick. You have to do it in polylog n times. You cannot do these sequential decisions. So the search version turns out to be pretty hard, or harder. So it took a decade to generalize the decision to a search. So that was first by Kapp, Uffal, Wigdorsson in 86, and then by Mulmay Vatsani. Vatsani has a cleaner, maybe a cleaner approach uh, a year later. So the general belief is that we should be able to de-randomize every efficient computation. <laughs> which we are far away from proving, or maybe not everybody believes, but there is good, uh, good indications that this should be true. Uh, so can we at least de-randomize one of these algorithms? It's uh, our more modest goal. And as, I, as you might see from the title, we still don't know, because there is a quasi in the title. OK, so what do we know? So is matching in NC? We don't know. <laughs> no, but we know from many special graph classes, OK? And in particular, we saw for a very nice you know, uh, result by first and now in Vatsen that uh, VA talked about, about planar graphs, uh, where we, and then in a pent result by Sankowski showed that uh, uh, for planar graphs, we can do the search version. That's a pretty special graph family because you can count in polytime. 
Okay, so all these special I don't I don't know all the definitions here, so don't ask me. But uh, it's not known for natural graph class, bark type graphs. So we don't know whether there is a deterministic parallel algorithm for matching uh, in bark type graphs. I think that's a beautiful question. But you know, in a major progress, uh, so Fenner, Gura, and Tiroff, they proved that the bark type matching is in quasi and C. So what does quasi and C? Now you allow yourself even more processes, so n to the power of poly, so quasi polynomial many processes, n to the power of poly log n processes, but you're still really fast. Okay, so that's a, that's a lot of processors, but in, con, in you know, in comparison, the pre prior results required exponentially many processors. So it was a big improvement what we knew how to do before. So I have their picture because uh, their approach is really nice and it was the inspiration by our work and most of this <laughs> presentation will be devoted to explaining their framework and see why it doesn't work for general graphs and what we have to do. Okay. Uh, and as I said, this is much harder. <laughs> it turns out that this graph is much harder than that one, as we'll see later on. All right, so what we proved, well, uh, unsurprisingly, that uh, we can do it for general graphs. So you can skip randomness, but it remains to deal with this quasi. Okay, so how do you go from pol down to poly n instead of n to power poly log n? And as you will see, I think there's a real barrier to get down to polynomial. One log is there for a very good reason. Okay, oh, bo both in the bipartite case and the general graph. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you want strictly polynomial processes, what's the number of rounds? You could also ask that. Yes. What do, what do you want? What do you need? What do you need? Like, is it square root uh, of the uh, Good question. I don't know. I don't. I don't. I think it would be polynomial many rounds. Polynomial, yeah. like even square root. Like. Yep. Would be my guess. I don't know any other algorithmic technique here than calculating the determinant. Hmm. Okay. But I, I, it's a good question. All right, so the outline now is that we give the basic approach that is used for the randomization here. Then I will explain this bipartite case proof, which is very clean. Hopefully I will do a good job. So the reason we start to work on this is because we saw uh, Guya's very nice 20-minute talk. It's basically the only 20-minute talk where I could almost understand the proof. <laughs> then I thought like, wow, we should work on the general case. <laughs> so now I have more time. <laughs> so hopefully I will be doing a reasonable job to explain their proof. Okay. And then we see difficult of the general case and our approach. Okay, so basic approach for de-randomization. Well, you could, you know, construct some great pseudo-random generator, or you can do, in this case, just de-randomize one of the randomized algorithms, okay, as I said before. And, and this here, the Mulmay, Vatsarani, and Vatsarani algorithm from 87 turns out to be great, okay? Because, you know, I can write this algorithm in two lines without defining everything. But these two lines are nice because the first line uses randomization. Basically, for each edge, I just select a random weight. And then in the second step, it's completely deterministic. So I, I have red, not good for us, green is good. So the green step is something calculated to determine something called a TAT matrix, where the entry of edge E has value 2 to the power of the weight. We don't need to understand what this means, but if you don't, it's a very nice and clean algorithm, so you know, if you haven't seen this before, it's, it's a nice looking into. But what we need to understand is that since I put in values 2 to the power of weight in my matrix, these weights have to be polynomially bounded, because otherwise your bit complexity will explode. Okay? So it's important that when you select the weights in the first step, they are not from a too big range. You don't want to have 1 to the power of 2 to the power of n here because then you will have double exponential weights, not good. So you should select your edge weights from a polynomial range. Okay? That's the restriction. So the algorithm has two steps. One randomized step, just select a random weight function, and then deterministic. They also give a very clean criteria when this algorithm is guaranteed to succeed. Okay? So this, this algorithm, the step two, is guaranteed to work if the weight function we selected is something called isolating. Okay. So what does that mean? I selected a weight function. I want that the min weight perfect matching with respect to that weight function is unique. There's no two perfect matchings that has the min weight. 
If I want to find a min weight perfect matching, it's a unique one. Okay. For example, if all the edge weights are one, all the matchings have the same unique. That's not a good function if you want to isolate. But it turns out that if you select the weights at random, even from a small set like one to n, n squared, you know, with very good probability it will be isolating. Which is kind of surprising, for me at least, because you know, there might be exponential many matchings, so most values will have exponential many matchings. But it turns out that the minimum one is unique, right? Because I only have polynomial weight functions, the weight of my matching will be in a polynomial range. So if I just look at the number of matchings for each value, it will be many matchings. But the min one is unique with good probability. If I, if I add n cube, it would be easier. n cube, it's even. So this here, I might be lying. So with n square, it may, might be one half. With n cube, it will be one minus one over n. So basically, it will be uh, the one minus the number of edges over the number of weights here. Yeah, uh, it, so as I said, I was surprised. Also, it's surprising if you read Wikipedia, there's like a four-line proof of this. So, so, because it's a union bound over the edges, that's where the edges come into play. You, feel, you, you do deferred decision. Suppose I've selected the, all the edge weights except for one edge. Now the probability that the mean weight matching will be like one over the number of uh, choices, whatever. That's not important, but it's surprising. So now, uh, so now uh, if we want to do something deterministic, all that we have to do right, is to replace this first step that selects the edge weights at random with something deterministic. And then we know that we have a randomized algorithm uh, that runs, no, deterministic algorithm that runs in parallel. Of course, it's important that we have that uh, weight function in parallel, because if so that's uh, our challenge. On input G, construct an isolating weight function in NC. Okay. So we will do a slightly harder challenge, <laughs> okay. which is maybe a nicer question. So oblivious challenge, I don't even give you the graph. I give you the size of the graph, so the N, the number of vertices of the graph. And now you are faced with the problem of constructing a family of weight functions, w star, that can be computed in parallel, so that for each graph, one of these weight functions are isolating. Okay. And I want the weights of the edges to be polynomially bounded. But remember, because I replaced the, the entries in the matrix by two to the power of weight, so I need this to be polynomially bounded. And now I want the number of weight functions to be polynomial in my family. Can you see why this would be a de-randomization if I want to run in parallel time? So I have polynomial in many weight functions. One of them is guaranteed to succeed. So I could just run them in parallel, all of them. Okay. So just oblivious de-randomization, just run all weight functions in parallel. Each graph, one of them, for each graph, one of them is guaranteed to succeed. So let's just check here to get comfortable. What if I remove the, the, the second assumption? Then I claim that uh, such a family exists with only one weight function. So if I allow my edge weights to be exponential, how would you set them? Oh, yeah, just, you can just put them, like if I didn't have this restriction, then a single weight function that is isolating is just, I order edges, I put wei to be equal to 2i. So now I basically reduced each matching will be dominated by the highest weight edge. If you're not, like you could even do like n to of 10i to be safe. <laughs> but 2 to of i is sufficient. Okay. <laughs> okay. And if I don't have, you know, if I don't bound the number of weight finds, right, just take all the possible outcomes and you're fine. Okay, so the real trouble here is uh, to do this. Uh, we, yeah. Be stupid. Yeah. Is it even information theoretically possible? I mean, 
not even whether it can be constructed in NC, but mm -hmm. is there such a small family? Yeah, uh, good question. So uh, since there is only ex like exponentially many graphs of size n, Taking a random one succeeds with probably one half. So, you know, taking polynomially many by union bound will succeed. Nice. But nice. there are doubly exponentially. So, isolation lemma actually works for any set family. So, there is doubly exponentially many set families. You would not be able to do an oblivious de-randomization for any set family. Okay. And we don't know how to get this. So, you know how to get this using randomness, but we don't know how to. Uh, uh, to get this uh, uh, with these bounds. So the best construction is exponentially in N. So what we do is to do, instead of poly N, quasi polynomial, and that's where quasi NC comes into play. Okay? So that's what they prove for bipartite graphs, and that's what we prove for general graphs. That such a family exists, and you can construct it in NC uh, without even looking at the graph. Okay. Any questions? So that, that's the goal. So now I will explain mostly spend my time explaining how do you prove that such a family exists for biotech graphs. So is this tight? Tight. No, no, there should be one for polynomial. It's not here. Uh, it, mm, it could be that. There's a strong belief that you should be able to construct one. It's because we can do it in randomized time by just no, selecting random. Maybe Nikhil is saying oblivious is, is tight. Yeah, what I'm saying is that you give me n. In randomized algorithm can output polynomial a uh, size W star that works with high probability. So, so there should be a way of doing it. Yeah. One question just for clarification. Why do you need uh, point C? Because you are evaluating these functions in parallel, right? So oh, I want to keep my number of processors to be polynomial. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. Otherwise, if I had many, <laughs> I thought polynomial in many processors sounds already unreasonable, but uh, quasi. <laughs> All right, how do we prove this? So one of the main ideas of Fenner-Guertiaf, maybe you can <laughs> guess what one of the main ideas is. So, so you know this uh, movie, that greed is good, greed is right, and so on. So actually, <laughs> so, so their, it's, it's, a, it's misleading, so their idea is that you know you should not be greedy, so they kind of watch the end of the movie or something. <laughs> it's like, it's like, and then, so instead of so remember our goal was to find an isolating weight function. So instead of finding an isolating weight function, let's do it step by step. All right. So let's just W for now be like a simple formula of weight, weight functions. Okay, it's polynomial many weight functions and so on. I select one of the weight functions from, so here I have a set of all matching, perfect matchings in my graph. I select one weight function in my weight class uh, of uh, my family of weight functions. Now I can minimize, I can select all the perfect matchings that minimize W1, right? If this is a unique perfect matching, I'm done. That's, that was my goal. Show, select the weight function uh, with a unique mean weight perfect match. If I'm not unique, I just continue. Select another weight function from this class of weight functions. Now, out of the matchings that minimize W1, let MT2 be the ones that minimize W2. Okay? So I get a smaller and smaller set, right? First, I have M1 that minimize W1. Now I have M2, a subset of M1 that also minimize W2. So it's like a lexicographic minimization. Okay? And I continue. Now the question is, how many weight functions do I need to select in order to have a unique perfect matching? So I think many of us would be able to do this by polynomial many weight functions, not too, <laughs> too uh, long uh, thinking. Uh, so what is really nice is that uh, uh, they managed to prove that you only need logarithmic many. Okay. So you need logarithmic many weight functions from this specific family, uh, so that uh, they, so, sorry. They show, for any graph G, there exists a way of selecting logarithmic many weight functions from this family, so that the matching that lexicographically minimizes them is unique. Okay. So no matter which graph you give me, there exists a logarithmic many weight functions, so that 
this mean weight matching is unique. That's what you want to prove, right? That you get a unique mean weight matching. So the family now will simply be this weight family to power of log n. I need to select log n weight families. Okay. So remember, it was lexicographic minimization. This, this is the yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, W star will just be, I put W1 on the most significant bits, W2 on the next significant bits, and so on. So, you know, this is the same thing as doing lexicographic minimization, right? I put W1 to be very, very important. I multiply by a huge weight. I multiply W2 by a huge but slightly smaller weight, and so on. So any perfect matching must minimize W1, W2, W log. So you say it's just existence. Yes, and this is important. At the moment, from now on, we don't care about parallel computing, except that our weight function should be structured enough so we can construct it in parallel. Now we only want to prove that there is a nice enough family of weight functions so that for any graph, one of them will work. And the nice enough weight func class of weight functions was this W star, which is basically select log and weight function from W. So, so, uh, so W is uh, W is basically you take this weight function, two to the power of i, but now you, W is equal to all the weight functions W k is equal to uh, E i is equal to two to the power of i mod k for all k two to the power to n to the power of four, let's say. So I just take this weight function that worked, that was isolating, and I take it mod many numbers. Okay. That's, my, that's my starting weight class. Okay. So you, uh, this will just come up in some old lemma. We don't need to know why I exactly choose this. Okay. But uh, what is important now is that from now on, we can spend exponential time selecting our weight functions if we would like to. We just need to show that you give me a graph. I need to show that there exists a W1, W2, W3, so that if I lexicographic minimize them, I get a unique perfect matching. That's our goal. Okay. So, let's, so that's our goal now. We want to show that for a given graph, we can select log and weight functions so that the matching is unique. Okay. Is that any questions or not? Yeah. Okay. All right, so we need a good progress measure. You might want to, like if it was polynomial and many weight functions, I think intuitively it's not so hard. But logarithmic seems weird. That seems like you need to get a very good progress measure, in my head at least. You know, there's exponentially many matchings. We need to go down to a unique one in only logarithmic many rounds. It would not be enough to half the number of matchings each step, for example. We need to do much better. Okay, so to understand a good progress measure, let's look at the case where we have a weight function w, but it's not isolating. What can we say about two mean weight perfect matchings? We have a green matching and a red matching. Well, first of all, what can you do when you have two way matchings? I mean, there's only one operation that you do. Right? You take the symmetric difference. So let's take the symmetric difference, you get a bunch of cycles since it was perfect matching. Now what can we say about the weight of each cycle? What can we say about the weight of the red edges and the weight of the green edges? These are two min weight perfect matchings. The same. They must be the same, right? Because if they were different, suppose the green edges here were cheaper than the red, then I could take the red matching everywhere else and the green matching here, getting an even smaller mean weight. Excellent. Okay, so now let's just define the discrepancy of cycle to be the weight of the red edges minus the weight of the green edges. Okay. So we know that the discrepancy of this cycle has to be zero. In other words, if the discrepancy of every cycle is not zero, we are done. Then the, then the, matching ha then the weight function has to be isolating. 
Okay? Because if it's not isolating, there exist two matchings. Taking the symmetric difference, the discrepancy along each cycle is zero. So our goal now can be rephrased to saying, I need to find a weight function so that the discrepancy along each cycle is non-zero. Every cycle is even if the graph is bipartite. OK, so that will be our progress. How many cycles have we managed to kill? Or how many cycles have we managed to assign non-zero discrepancy to? All right, so this looks good. So the only issue is that the graph may have experienced too many cycles. So there's a lot of stuff to deal with. But as we say, we should not be greedy. So this is all lemma. And that's why I selected a weight function class as I did. Give me any collection of polynomial many cycles. Let's say n to power 4 many cycles. One of these weight functions will assign all of them non-zero discrepancy. Okay? So you give me n to power 4 cycles. One of these weight functions from this family will assign them all non-zero discrepancy. So if the graph had few cycles, we would be done. Just take one of these weight functions, it assigns non-zero discrepancy to all of them, it must be isolating. Not so easy, but we can cope with all the four cycles. I mean, there's at most n choose four, four cycles, so we could cope at least with four cycles. Okay? So let's do that. Let's select w1. We know w1 exists because of the old lemma so that all the four cycles have non-zero discrepancy. So here is an example. This would be my weight function. This is a four cycle, right? It has discrepancy 3 minus 2, so 1. This four cycle has 3 minus 2, 1. Okay. So if we look at the min weight perfect matchings with respect to this weight function, it will be the one that takes 1, 1, and 0, 1, 1, and 0, okay. and that's it. This guy is not mean weight anymore, it has weight free. Okay. So the active subgraph, we call it active subgraph, containing all those edges that take part in at least one mean weight perfect matching, contains those edges. So it's the green edges plus the red edges. Okay, so that's active subgraph containing all the edges that, contain, uh, that exist in, exact, uh, in at least one mean weight perfect matching. What do you think we can say about the active subgraph after selecting the W1 to assign non-zero discrepancy to all the four cycles? So I assign non-zero discrepancy to all the four cycles. I got these two mean weight matchings. Here I look at all the union of the edges in the matchings. What can I say about this graph here? Number of edges are reduced. Number of edges are reduced. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the picture is pretty suggestive. <laughs> no short cycles. No short cycles. There is no four cycles anymore, right? This had two four cycles and this has no four cycles. Very good. All right. And that, that's, that's what happens. And this is only for uh, bipartite graphs, as we will see. Okay? So once we assign a cycle non zero discrepancy and minimize that weight function, the cycle will disappear from the active subgraph. Okay. So in particular, if we assign non-zero discrepancy here for all the four cycles, those cycles disappear in the active subgraph. Okay. All right, so give me, I'll give you uh, uh, one proof. If you're into polytopes, it will be a very easy proof. Otherwise, it's just two slides. Okay. All right, so let's look at this. So let's look at the convex hull of the perfect matchings of a graph. Okay. We will minimize some weight or maximize some weight function, let's say. So we hit some phase of this polytope. Okay. Okay. So this, the extreme points here all corresponds to the min weight perfect matchings of that weight function. Okay. If, it was a if it was a unique point, we would be done. It was isolating. But now it's not isolating, so there might be three perfect matchings minimizing this wave. All right. So far, not so much information. But, you know, bipartite graphs have a very nice polytope. 
we only need to write that the fractional degree for edge vertex is equal to 1, and the edges are non-zero. Okay? So every, we have a variable for each edge. This means that I sum up over the edges incident at the right vertex should be equal to 1, and it's non-negative. Non so how does a face look like in the bipartite matching polytope? Okay, if it, a face is also obtained by setting a subset of inequalities to equalities, right? So the only way we can get a face here is by setting some edges to be equal to zero. Okay. So this face here, F, is obtained by dropping some edges. So any face of the bipartite matching is just a subgraph where you deleted some edges. And that's what's going to happen. We're going to delete some edges of the cycles. All right. So what can we say about the weights of the points in F? That's a maybe too trivial question. So F was minimizing the weight function. So for sure, they will all have the same weight, right? This, these, all these matchings were mean weight matchings, so the convex hull will have the same weight. So that's all we need to know. OK, so we need that. This is the perfect matching polytope, and all the points on the face F have the same weight. Okay. Now suppose towards contradiction that the subgraph has a cycle of non-zero discrepancy, the active subgraph. So active subgraph is just the graph that has edges, which is a union of the matching corresponding to the extreme points. Okay. So let's, let's look at this cycle as non-zero discrepancy. Let me now define the point x that is just the average of all the matchings of the face. Okay. The reason I do this is because then I'm sure that every edge of this cycle will have a positive value. right? Because I took the average over all the matchings, these were the union of the matchings. Okay. Now you know, if, you, like, if you've done some combinatorial organization, you know where I'm heading. You know, now I have a fractional, I have a fractional point on the face where every edge has a positive value, and I have a cycle, and it's a bipartite graph. Okay? But this means that I can increase, for example, the fractional value on the red edges, decreasing on the green edges, while still staying inside the face, right? Because the face is just described by these uh, degree constraints. So I maintain the degree constraints by increasing the red, decreasing the green. Okay? Or the other way around. But you know, this weight, this, the discrepancy of this cycle was non zero. This means that I'm walking inside F from X to Y, changing the weights. It's a contradiction because everything in F had the same weight. Okay. So that's the, that's the hardest proof in their paper, I think. It's a beautiful paper. <laughs> okay. Now we're almost done. Uh, now we have all the ingredients. We, have this, we can remove any polynomial in many cycles. So combining the old lemma with bipartite key pro uh, property enables us that each selection of the weight function, we can actually remove polynomial many cycles from the graph. Okay? And as I said, let's start by removing all the cycles of length 4. Okay. Okay. Let's now remove all the... <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> we have removed all the cycles of length 4. Let's remove all the cycles of length at most 8. How many cycles of length at most 8 can I graph without any cycles of length 4 have? Well, that's at most n to the power 4. Okay. okay, so we have a graph without 4 cycles. Now we remove all the guys of 8. So what do you do next? <laughs> we have removed all the cycles of length 8. Now it is 16 are removed. Again, a uh, graph with no smaller than 8 has at most n to power 4 cycles of length 16. And that's it. So now you have done log n steps. After log n steps right there, you have no cycles of length n. That means that the graph has a unique mean weight perfect matching. Okay. So this is a pretty fundamental reason why you need the quasi NC. You know this, instead of being greedy, showing that you can select W1 to be isolating, you do it in this very smart progress measure, killing cycles. Is it clear? Yeah. So something is confusing because like you, are, you said you are going to construct oblivious family, but this is, seems to be. So now I have constructed a family which is just w to power of log n. It's oblivious, right? It's this family here. Oh, I see. But I have to show to you that if you give me a graph, there exists a way of selecting w1, and this is the way of selecting w. This is just in the proof. 
Is it clear why a graph with no four cycles have no, not many eight cycles? Uh, it, okay. I, th I, I, I think the, the proof is very clean. <laughs> so let me take, suppose there is an eight cycle. Okay, just number the vertices. You, and then you write down A, B, C, and D. So you write down an encoding containing four numbers, the labels of those vertices. Suppose two eight cycles have the same labeling. Okay, so I have two eight cycles containing A, B, C, D for the same vertices. Well then, you know, they are not the same cycle, so they must deviate between two labels, and that must be a four cycle, which was a contradiction. Okay, so <laughs> that's the proof. So at hindsight, it's, <laughs> it's easy, but it looks like a very nice fact. Hey, if I don't have any eight cycles, I don't have many 16 cycles and so on. Okay, so I think I will go very, okay, so preliminary perspective, so what did we do? Okay, we will select first the weight function, we minimize, we end up at the phase F1, we stick to that phase, we select W2, we stick to that phase, W3, we stick to that phase, and in the end of the day, we end up at an extreme point. So you know, you would expect the dimension of your phase to go down every time, but here we are seeing very rapid progress, we are only selecting log n weight functions. So the, this worked because every face is a subgraph, and we had this great progress measure that GERF doubled in each round. So what is the difficulties in the general case? Well, the problem is that this is not true anymore. So, so this goes out the window. Uh, and, and the problem is that, <laughs> that massive, you have these uh, exponentially many uh, constraints in the, the characterization of the perfect matching polytope of general graphs that you say that for every odd set of vertices, at least one edge has to go down. Okay. So now, not every face is a subgraph, right? Every face is obtained by removing some edges, but also by keeping some tight odd sets. And it's like exponential many constraints, it looks bad. And unfortunately, Thomas, right, a lot of us proved that we need so many inequalities, so it's not just because we didn't understand the perfect matching problem. So this polytope is way harder than than, than by Actually, so I think GERF doesn't make progress, sense as a progress measure. Okay. So, so actually, here's the example. <laughs> so this graph has four perfect matchings, which is this. If I assign a weight function that uh, assigns non-zero discrepancy on all the four cycles, like for example that one, weights on all the edges, weight one on all these edges, weight zero on the other ones. If you look at the convex hull of perfect match, this will be the perfect min weight perfect matchings. If you look at the convex hull of these weight matchings, they keep all the edges of the graph. So there's no edge that will disappear. Okay. And what happened is instead that each min weight perfect matching now has to select exactly one of these edges, right? So there is an odd set that became tight. If you were two weeks ago, you realize, okay, so. <laughs> You realize that these guys are not only bad, right? We can tame them down to angels <laughs> because they also tell us some information about the, 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 the solution. Okay, so let me, so let me, so this will go quick just to give you a high level idea. So first of all, I told you that there's exponentially many constraints. Well, life is not that bad. Each face is described by a lamina family of tight sets. So, uh, so in fact, each phase is just described by two n minus one tight sets, at most. So, lamina family is a set of tight sets where no two sets intersect non-trivially. So, everything is a subset or disjoint. Okay, and when we now walk inside our polytope, we will ha two things will happen: the lamina family will get refined, meaning that add more sets are consistent with what I have already had, and some edges will disappear. Before in the biplate case, only edges disappeared. The difficulty comes from these odd tight sets. Okay? But they're good in some sense. They're not only bad, right? Because once I get a tight odd set, I know that any min weight perfect matching needs to select exactly one edge crossing this set. That's what it tells me, right? It's tight because any min weight perfect matching has to select exactly one edge. Okay? 
So after fixing the boundary edge, the problem decomposes into two independent problems. You know, they, they don't interact anymore because I fixed the edge crossing this boundary. Now they're independent. It's decomposed into two independent problems. Okay, so I, so it's, okay. Okay, so if I fix that, 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 it decomposes into in two independent problems. One inside and one outside. One inside and one outside. So this begs for a divide and conquer approach, right? I fix this edge. Let's say I guess there is at most n square many options of these edges. There are at most n square many edges. It decomposes into two independent problems. And this, if these were balanced cuts, the depth of this would be log n. And that's basically what we do. You have to be a little bit careful. Uh, gets a little bit technical, as I, <laughs> as this picture shows. <laughs> Let me skip that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I felt like you can ask me, but that is like the intuition is hey, either you get a lot of edges dropped, there's a tight set, you can do divide and conquer. The tight sets are not all that bad because they actually tell you that if you select one edge crossing a tight set, it decomposes into two independent problems. So, actually, as I, yeah, so here, uh, Mm, it seems like it's uh, non-trivial to go down to NC. So this uh, log comes for a good reason that we are not greedy. We are, even for bike type graphs, we have no clue how to not select this in log n rounds to have a girth as a progress measure. We have no progress measure where we can select constantly many weight functions. And then, you know, there has been work of the randomized isolation lambda in other cases, like a matrix intersection and uh, totally unimodular polytopes also giving quasi, because all, all, basically all the works were inspired by Guria, Tiroff, and Fenner's work on bipartite matchings that uses these log n rounds. And this problem, <laughs> I've, tried, I've been trying for a while without success, it has an insane status. So I'm given a bipartite graph, some edges are color red, I'm also given an integer k, now I only have to decide whether the graph has a perfect matching containing exactly k red edges. Okay. So it's like the perfect matching problem, but I have to find one that contains exactly k red edges, even for bipartite graphs. Okay. So, well, there is a randomized algorithm that even runs in parallel, but we do not have any algorithm in P even. So if, if I do not use randomness, there's not even a polynomial time algorithm. And and the randomized algorithm works for general graphs, but even for bipartite graphs, we have no algorithm in P. So th that's pretty weird. Okay, so thanks. That's it. Yeah. How complicated is that randomized algorithm? So it's <coughs> an. So it's an advanced exercise if you know Mulmui uh, Vatsani Vatsani. Or even if you know uh, like uh, this uh, de determinant based algorithms. And the second thing you know. We can, I can tell you after. Yeah. And the LP doesn't help in this case because that fractional solution maybe not is. So that's one of the reasons that this is a very interesting problem. Like for perfect matching, right, we know everything. We know it's in P, we know it's convex hull. For exact matching, we basically know nothing since it's not in P. We don't have any good structure information. So we don't know of a good linear programming, linear program. We don't know how to characterize the convex hull in a nice way. For, no, uh, I, mean, I mean to say the decision version of this problem is also. The yeah, I mean, since it's, it's, just a, it's in P, it's usually the same, right? If you can solve. So, have people tried kind of more sophisticated some number theoretic constructions of these families inspired by the pseudo random generators? Yes, would be my guess. Yes. I mean, this is a very, very special case of polynomial identity testing. And this was known as a e, like easy special case of, maybe you know better, but uh, yes, I think uh, people have tried. You know, 
Yes. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't. But I would guess yes. Any more questions? Okay. Stop all around. Stop all around. Thank you.